So good afternoon, everybody. Got the coveted after lunch spot. Thanks very much, Tom. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, September 12th, 1962. John Kennedy at Rice University at the football stadium in front of 42,000 people stands up and gives to me one of the transformative speeches in American history. And it's the famous speech where he says, we choose to go to the moon and do other things, not because they're easy, but because they're hard. But the interesting part about that speech is later on, he says something that I thought was unbelievably profound. I've used it as a thesis topic. I've used it multiple times. The last time I spoke in front of an audience on artificial intelligence, I used it to finish my remarks. And because of some recent events, I'm gonna use it to start it today. And the quote is, space science, like nuclear science and all technologies, has no conscience. Whether it's to be used for good or ill depends on man. And only if the United States occupies a position of preeminence can we guarantee that this new ocean we're about to embark on becomes a sea of peace or a terrifying new theater of war. And when I look at both those quotes for my whole life, it's fascinated me the things that he added in. And if you can actually walk through the, the, uh, the Capitol, you'll see the handwritten remarks from John Kennedy as he edits that speech that goes forward. So why did he say space science and nuclear science and all technology? Why did he say we choose to go to the moon and other things, what did he mean by and other things? What did he mean by and all technologies? He's talking, James Webb is there, he's talking to NASA, he's talking to the, the people in Houston that are gonna take us to the moon, that are gonna achieve that objective by landing a man on the moon by the end of the decade, and he adds the phrases and other things and all technology. Well, we're standing here today because of the all technology. We're standing here today First, to me, it was cyber was the next piece of the puzzle. Now artificial intelligence is that piece. Now quantum computing is gonna be that piece as we go forward. And it's gonna be fascinating to watch this. But another speech was given just three weeks ago at The Hague in the Netherlands. A very important speech for everybody in this room. It will never be famous like Kennedy's speech in 1962, uh, but Ambassador Bonnie Jenkins uh, the Undersecretary of State for Arms Control and International Security stood up in The Hague around 80 nations and prepared a proposal for the responsible um, use of the responsible artificial intelligence uh, for the military domain. It's called R-E-A-I-M. Now, I'm not going to pronounce that acronym for obvious reasons. Uh, but the State Department picked it for some reasons, but responsible artificial intelligence for the military domain. And in it, she presented this series of what she proposes are norms of behavior for operating the military in the artificial intelligence domain. And it's pretty significant. But interestingly enough, 60 of the countries that were there agreed with those precepts that she put forward. One of those countries was China. They agreed with the way it was defined as responsible uses of artificial intelligence. The other fascinating part about that is it wasn't a proposal to ban the use of artificial intelligence for military operations. It was to define responsible behavior. In the space domain, we've still not yet defined responsible behavior in space. But now at the beginning of the real incorporation of artificial intelligence in the military, we put forth some very, very specific guidelines. I'll simplify for them if you don't want to look it up and read it. It's really pretty straightforward. It basically says we use, shouldn't use operational intelligence for the employment of nuclear weapons. Anybody disagree with that? No. It says if we're going to use lethal means, we need to have a human in the loop for how we use artificial intelligence to deliver a lethal effect. It's pretty straightforward. 
It's actually very logical and very straightforward. And to me, and you can talk to Greg Little, he's gonna speak after me, it's actually enabling for the military to do what we need her to do. So I wanna talk about the example, just a couple of examples of what is available today that we could be using artificial intelligence for today that meet the definition of responsible use that would improve our ability to do military operations in amazing ways. And I'm gonna choose kind of two examples, one a very, very small example and one the biggest example. The smallest example is gonna be the airplane. As an airman, I'm comfortable talking about the airplane. I'll talk about the airplane from a readiness perspective all the way through the tactical level of war, which is basically uh, airplane against airplane, airplane against target, the operational level of war, which is an airplane in a campaign, and then the strategic level of war, which is the airplane integrated into everything that we do as a nation with our allies in order to uh, be victorious, preventing war, and if that fails, be victorious in fighting war. That's what we have to do. And then I'll talk about the opportunities for artificial intelligence in every one of those. And I hope you'll see when I'm, when I'm done that it's sitting right there for us and we're being unbelievably slow taking advantage of what is there. And the next, I thought about this long and hard, after I'm done talking about an airplane, I'm gonna talk about nuclear weapons and artificial intelligence. That makes people really, really nervous. I know it, if I was at Stratcom, my public affairs guy would be trying to shoot me right now for even walking down that path, but I think it's unbelievably instructive on the power of artificial intelligence in making our military better and if you want to know the reasons we have nuclear weapons to begin with, when I, I was the strategic command commander responsible for all the nuclear weapons, like Tom said this morning, when uh, Jim Mattis became Secretary of Defense. So he called all the COCOMs in. I spent a couple hours with him. I'm going through all the nuclear doctrine. I'm going through the nuclear war plans. I'm going through the Black Book. I'm going through all those pieces. And finally, he just has had enough in typical Marine fashion. He goes, stop. You're killing me. Just tell me in plain English, why do we have nuclear weapons? And I said, to keep people from using nuclear weapons on us. That's really that simple if you always remember it. So as I get into the nuclear piece at the end, keep that at the back of your mind as I go through the role of artificial intelligence in our nuclear business. So, the airplane. Airplanes been around since the Wright brothers, over 100 years. Uh, it's truly remarkable what the airplane has done. Uh, people talked this morning about the airplane in World War I. Uh, Tom talked about transitioning in, in the interwar years. And as an airman, I, I studied the Air Corps Tactical School, the transition of the airplane, all the theories about the bomber will always get through. We don't need fighters. Nope, we need fighters. We don't need bombers. All those arguments, but it's an airplane. And you know what the most important thing about an airplane is it doesn't matter whether you're an airline or the military, you know the most important thing about an airplane? Is if it can fly. If an airplane can't fly, it's not very good. So the most important thing is to make the airplanes fly. Tom talked about the B-1B this morning. I owned the B-1Bs when I was the Stratcom commander and I actually had to ground the entire fleet of 44 at one point because I was so afraid of flying that old airplane. I couldn't figure out what was gonna break. I couldn't figure out what was gonna break in the air and I didn't want it to break in the air, so I grounded the whole fleet. Now, we're flying the B-1B again, but you get up to 18, 18 out of 44 is not good. If you think about a deterrent, a deterrent is the ability of an adversary to look at you and say, not today. If your planes are on the ground, that's not good for deterrence. And so when you increase the ability of airplanes to fly, you increase your readiness of your force and you increase the deterrent value on the force and if you ever have to fight, you have more to bring to bear, which if you do it right, will keep you from having to go fight. So that's the whole concept of deterrence and it's actually, hell, we haven't had great power war on this planet since 1945. We've had war, we've had conflict. You still can't prevent the Vietnam, the Ukraine, the the different uh, tragedies that happen from a human perspective, but the great power war that killed tens and tens and tens of millions of people 
has not happened since 1945. That's one of the longest periods in human history because sadly, war is a condition of humankind. I wish it wasn't, but it is. And so you gotta figure out first how to prevent it, then how to win if you actually get into it. So the first thing is get the airplane ready and you, you saw the numbers. We have technology right now that can improve the reliability of our Air Force. Oh, by the way, we could do it with tanks, we could do it with Bradleys, we could do it with aircraft carriers, we could do it with destroyers, we could do it across the entire fleet. And it's actually not that hard. Uh, you know, Tom didn't give me authority to tell you how much the Air Force paid for that, but it was nothing in the overall scheme of the budget, literally nothing, and it improves our ability to fly the AWACS, to fly the B-1, to fly the F-16. It's just remarkable. So the first thing to do is get the airplanes flying, and then you employ them. Let's talk about the employment of the tactical level. In the early days, they just took pictures, and then somebody figured out how to throw a grenade off it, and then somebody figured out how to tie a bigger bomb on the bottom of it and drop it off, but they couldn't figure out how to figure out where to go. In World War II, we're flying hundreds of B-17s to try to take out one ball bearing plant that today, a single airplane, the B-2, well, the B-52 if you want to go in an old air, but a B-2 can carry 80 separately targetable weapons that can attack 80 targets on the ground across a broad swath of land all at once and destroy them with precision. That's an amazing transformation. But it's just one airplane. And you have to figure out, okay, is the airplane the right tool to get after that target? Is the airplane the right tool to do that? How about using an Army long-range strike system? How about using a Navy capability? How about using the other capability? And so when you take it above the tactical level, think about what you could do with the tactical level just on employment of weapons. But now you get to the operation level, which is taking that airplane, put it with other airplanes and ships and tanks and everything that we have, and you put it into a single thing and try to figure out what is the best way to present a force to the adversary that they won't attack you, to present a force to the adversary that if they do attack you, you will destroy them. Ideally, they'll know that. What's the best mix of weapons that you want to have deployed? What's the mix of weapons you want to have structured? How do I get the logistics train, the supply chain, all the way from the United States to wherever I have to go? How do I set that up? How do I integrate the fires among the different elements of the Army, the Navy, Air Force, Marines? The Space Force will have fires at some point. How do I integrate all those pieces together and use the right thing at the right place at the right time? We do that today with a bunch of people sitting around a table trying to figure it out. And it's, it's a near infinite problem. What's the best way to do that? So you end up with the Army saying this, the Navy saying this, the Air Force saying this. How do I pull it all together? At the operational level, that is joint all domain command and control. And we kind of coined that term when I was the vice chairman. I wrote the requirements for joint all domain command and control, embedded in that requirement and embedded in all the supporting concept requirements of the new joint warfighting concept was a simple statement that was profound on all the services because in the requirements document it says from this point forward in the Department of Defense all data will be made available. Period. That's it. Because if you can't achieve that requirement then Greg Little has no chance to actually build all domain command. He has no chance to actually integrate artificial intelligence unless all that data is available because it's all about the data. We talked a lot about artificial intelligence this morning, but if you look at the, the platform that we're talking about, you look at that entire structure, it's all about data. It was quickly mentioned, we have the ability to take massive amounts of data and create an image now. That's the only way you can get after this problem. You have to figure out how to do that and then you can present it. So Right now, in most all our platforms, they're still proprietary data owned by contractors. We can't get the data off the platform. Heck, when we built the F-35, it couldn't even talk to the F-22. That is a true story. How do you build a fifth generation fighter that doesn't talk to the fifth generation fighter? And they're built by the same company. It's just unbelievable the things that we do. So you have to make all the data available. And if you do, holy cow, imagine what you can do if I can integrate all those things together. And I watched the services try to implement joint all domain command and control. And to be honest, I get frustrated. I get frustrated at my service for their air battle management system because what they're doing is really important. It's trying to figure out how to take sensor information and give it to the shooters faster. 
and the Navy's trying to do the same thing, and the Army's trying to do the same thing. But think about how I just defined joint all domain and command and control. Does that sound like sensor to shooter faster to you? Not a lot of military people in this room, but just basic common sense says, if I can integrate all that information together, I've now fundamentally changed everything. That's the operational level of war, not the strategic level of war. What is the strategic level of war? That's the integration of the military with all other elements of national power and our allies and partners. So how do we do that today? It's a bunch of folks sitting around a table. That's how we integrate the whole of government. We have a process in Washington called the interagency process. It starts with a, a bunch of staffers and colonels and one-star generals that get together and they talk and then they bring it up to the deputies committee which is me as the vice chairman, the deputies of uh, all the departments and we sit around and we talk and we try to figure out how to do it. We try to integrate commerce and treasury and, and integrate military and, and state and everything and then we get to the National Security Council, the principals committee where it's all the principals and we try to make some decision and we do it all in our head and we're all old and outdated. Does that make any sense to you? Imagine what you could do is if you had tools that you could apply to our whole of government across the board that took all the tools that commerce has, all the tools that treasury has, all the tools the state has, and then most importantly, all the information from the intelligence community. The intelligence community has 18 different elements in the intelligence community. The Space Force is the 18th element of the intelligence community. Each one of them has a stovepiped stove -piped relational database that has their intelligence information in. And you know how they're integrated? Bunch of folks sitting around the table trying to figure it out. Just imagine if you could take all of that and look for common factors. What, what just changed on the ground? What just changed overseas? Did you see from space the Russian tanks moving? Did you see through different intelligence information uh, medical supplies moving? Did you see all of this stuff. And then, is there anything we can do in commerce and treasury to stop it before it actually happens? Is there anything we can do without using military force to stop it happening? But we all sit in our own stovepipes and we all let it work out. Imagine, at the strategic level of war, what you could accomplish if you could just take some of these basic tools, put the data there, make the data available. Oh, by the way, that doesn't mean we have to own it. This has to be available, and then just apply some of these tools and see what you learn. All right, let's talk about nuclear weapons. This went from an airplane to the strategic level of war. Well, how the heck does that apply to nuclear weapons? What's the most important thing about our nuclear weapon arsenal in the United States of America? It's safe, secure, and reliable. Anybody want our nuclear arsenal not to be safe, secure, and reliable? It's not that hard to figure out, so. How do we guarantee safe and secure? Well, we take the smartest physicists and engineers that we have in this country. We assign them to the nuclear weapons labs at Los Alamos and Livermore and Sandia. Uh, we take the most powerful computers we have and we take the simulations that were built from our nuclear weapons design. The last time we tested was over 30 years ago. That's where all that test aid is. We put it through the supercomputers and then we take our current designs, look at it, and then the engineers and physicists make an assessment. And I tell you, at STRATCOM it comes to me and I have to sign and it's gotta to go to the Secretary of Energy and the President of the United States that says, yes, it's safe, secure. And I added reliable because if we ever have to use it, it better work. And the adversary better know it better work, otherwise they might take a chance and use a nuclear weapon against us. So the most important thing we have to do with nuclear weapons is make sure they work. We have plutonium pits in our nuclear weapons that are gonna be 80 years old. Plutonium has a half-life of forever. But what happens when you create a severe out of plutonium and you have it just sit there for 80 years? I don't know. Physicists look at it and they make their judgments in the whole nine yards. And then 
the weapons platforms that we put these nuclear weapons on, the intercontinental ballistic missiles, the sea launch ballistic missiles, airplanes, B-2s and B-52s, the weapons platforms are ancient, 30, 40 years old. And we have 400 intercontinental ballistic missiles deployed. They're all 30, 40 years old. How do I know they're, they're gonna work? Well, you take a bunch of guys, you sit around the table, you look at all the data that you can, piece by piece. Imagine if I could take every piece of maintenance data from the Minuteman ICBM and put it into place. And now that I'm gonna transit into the new Sentinel ICBM and I have to pull one out of a hole and put another one in a hole, how do I make sure the whole thing is ready? Wouldn't it be a good idea if I just took all that data, put it into a system, made it accessible, then applied all of the tools that I could and got to an answer that said, yes, it's safe, secure, and reliable. Then at the tactical, an operational level for nuclear weapons, what the heck could AI do for that? All right, we're, we're never going to deploy nuclear weapons or employ nuclear weapons without a human in the loop. I, c I can go through in spades the amazing processes that we have to make sure that they're safe, secure, reliable, and only be used under proper, proper lawful order in the right time, in the right place, all those things. I'm not talking about that. So let's talk about nuclear planning and execution. And believe me, nobody likes to talk about nuclear planning and execution, but in Omaha, there is a piece of software called the Nuclear Planning and Execution System, and it was built for the United States and the Soviet Union so it used to be that, you know, back in the early days of nuclear weapons, we had a counter value strategy where they would enjoy, destroy our cities, we'd destroy their cities, and that was mutually assured destruction, we'd never go there. We decided that was actually criminally wrong, just to indiscriminately kill. So now we have a counter force strategy, which means our nuclear weapons are targeted against the adversary's nuclear weapons. So first thing you have to know is where's the adversary's nuclear weapons? They actually don't tell you they actually try to hide them. So you, you're looking for them, trying to figure out where they are, all the things you're gonna do, and then you have a limited number of weapons, because the New START Treaty defines a limited number of weapons, and you have to assign them to targets, and then you have to somehow message that to an adversary so they know, no, not today. We have spent hundreds of millions of dollars trying to upgrade the nuclear planning and execution system, and we continue to struggle with the most basic thing. And I talked to, Tom Seville about it a few months ago, and I, I just said, so Tom, there's a finite number of targets, finite number of weapons, each target has a certain value. How long would it take to, to actually put an algorithm together that would figure out how to best do that? And he's going, I don't know, a couple people, a couple weeks? We've been doing it for decades and struggling, spending hundreds of millions of dollars when we have the tools right now that we could do that much more efficiently and effectively, and now, we have a three-body problem. The previous STRATCOM commander, a good friend of mine, called it a three-body problem, because if, and I, I love that, because if you're a, kind of a, you know, an astrophysicist, a three-body problem is very, very difficult to solve. You know, three bodies orbiting is such a, a massive amount of uncertainty and a massive amount of of unpredictable things, it's almost impossible to solve a three-body problem orbiting around each other in space. And now we have China, Russia, and the United States. And we still have a limited number of nuclear weapons. So how do we deter China, deter Russia, and deter us at the same time? We have a tough enough time dealing with one adversary, now we have two personal adversaries, and then we have North Korea on top of that. How do we do that? We do it with a bunch of guys sitting around a table, a bunch of guys building plans. We have the tools right now to allow us to do that infinitely better. And then at the strategic level of war, the highest level of war, with nuclear weapons, what's the first, what's the reason that we have nuclear weapons? To present some, prevent somebody from nuclear wep using nuclear weapons against us. That simple. Now, if we could take our nuclear arsenal, combine it with our space capabilities, our cyber capabilities, our conventional capabilities, our whole of government capabilities across state, commerce, treasury, combine that with our allied capabilities, we can create a structure that will guarantee that an adversary will never 
reach out and try to strike us. That's what the current Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, called integrated deterrence, putting all those kind of pieces together. And I tell you, when I was, you know, I was the vice chairman when he became secretary and he started talking about integrated deterrence in his first speech and I got all excited because I've studied deterrence my entire life and I've, here's the secretary of defense that's talking about integrated deterrence. I put together all these fancy machination, different models of doing it and he goes, you're just way overcomplicating it. All integrated deterrence is, is taking everything we got, putting it all together and presenting a picture to an adversary that makes them say not today. That's all it is. But how do we do that? We do even that with nuclear weapons involved with a bunch of guys sitting around a table making best judgment. And guys is a general neutral term when I grew up, so I apologize to the women in the crowd, but it's just a bunch of people sitting around a table. We have tools right now that exist, and you've seen some of them today. Some of you in this room that run massive industries with tens of thousands of employees, with supply chains that go acro across this planet all over the place, that you have to worry about supplies down to, to minute elements of metals. And you have to figure out how to work the China problem, the Ukraine problem, the Russia problem. You have all of these, these, these things, and you can see how these tools become incredibly beneficial. Well, imagine what you could do that to the military enterprise if we could figure out how to do that. And, you know, I'm not in government anymore, so Greg is going to stand up and tell you how he's going to figure out how to do that. So God bless you, Greg, for taking that on. But it is a tough problem. But an article came out yesterday. Actually, technically, I guess it would be today because it came out in Australia. It was... Uh, published by the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. And they did an assessment of 44 emerging technologies uh, in China and the West. Not China and the United States, China and the West. That's the way they referred to it. China versus the United States and our allies. Because China basically doesn't have any allies that they can lean on. We have many. And so, of those 44, they assessed that China was ahead of the United States and our allies in 37 of them. In those 37 was artificial intelligence, robotics, hypersonics, just go down the list. And so I, I fundamentally disagree with that because one of the last things I did as vice chairman is I took the Joint Requirements Oversight Council, the JROC, which is the vice chiefs, all the four stars from all the services, and I took them around and we visited industry. Seattle, Silicon Valley, uh, San Diego, Austin, Cambridge. We just, instead of going to see all the other combatant commanders, we said, let's go see the non-traditional industry. And we saw the traditional industry too, the, the Boeings, the Northrop's, but let's look at the non-traditional industry. And what you find is unbelievable innovation. Unbelievable innovation. Just amazing. It's, it's out there. This country still leads the world in many of this, but it's in the commercial sector now. And the challenge we have is that we in the United States call um, leveraging the commercial sector using dual-use technology. I guarantee you China does not have dual-use technology. Anything that China develops is used by the PLA, and it's used right now. And we can't figure out how to cross that, that gap between the commercial sector of this building stuff and the Department of Defense who needs this stuff. And so, I disagree a little bit with the, the Australians. I have an Australian son-in-law, so I say that advisedly. But we just have to figure out how to leverage it. And we have to figure out how to buy it different. But ladies and gentlemen, what you've seen today is it's right there for us. It's sitting right there, like all technologies. Do other things exactly what President Kennedy was talking about. We have the ability to do it and ask for your help, everybody in this room's help. It's not just Greg's little job. Everybody should be demanding of our nation, demanding of our allies that we figure out how to leverage this. It's critically important.
and I look forward to being a part of it. So thank you very much.